Neil Channing, our guest today. Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this, man. Oh, wow. I was listening to that. I was wondering who it was going to be. <laughs> well, I didn't want to tell the listeners that you actually emailed me that intro. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, actually, that thing about the, the most caches, uh, I, Surrender and I had a bit of rivalry about that. I'd like to give him a bit of stick about that. So I, I think you should just repeat the bit about above Surrender. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've got two more than Surrender for the all-time UK lead. So he's got some catching up to do. He kind of pretends he doesn't care about those things, but I know he does. Well, he obviously does. Very competitive guy. Hey, I want to start, if we can, with Dave Ulliott. The Devilfish apparently in bad shape, fighting cancer. Are you close with him? I know you played against him a lot. What do you know about that situation, and what kind of guy is he? I saw him like six or seven weeks ago, and we had a chinwag. Me, him. It's not a name-dropping story, but me, him, and Sam Trickett. Sam Trickett I hadn't seen for a while. I was chatting to him because he'd just come back from holiday. And he was telling me how he'd been on a holiday with this girl, and he was telling me all about this relationship, whatever. And then, you know, if you're having any kind of relationship uh, discussions and you need advice, who better than the devilfish to come and join the conversation? <laughs> uh, he came along and joined in, and he gave Sam some valuable pointers, I thought. <laughs> to be honest, I, I, somebody texted me Saturday morning and said, I, I, have you heard about the devilfish? He's very seriously ill. And... Um, I said, well, you know, like, what, what did you hear? And he said, well, I heard he's got colon cancer, which apparently is true. So I hope he's not as bad as people were saying, but I believe that he has got colon cancer and, uh, you know, it's not a very nice thing to have. So I wish him well. Dave and I have been, you know, he was around long before me. He's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a formidable player. He's been a rival at the table. And when I was quite a sort of young, up-and-coming guy, uh, he was very much an established guy, and I, I watched the first late night poker in '99, and you know the same as everyone else. I was like, "Wow, the Devilfish is like, he's just completely better than all of these people." He understood tournaments. He was a professional. A lot of the people on late night poker were amateur players, and uh, he he just got it more than they did. He he was uh, he, he was very inspirational actually to a lot of people of my generation probably that kind of got into poker, really kind of pre-money maker, you know, in the kind of, uh, you know, I was playing poker in uh, in the early 90s, but it was really that kind of turn of the century time, 99, 2000, 2001, where the Devilfish was on TV all the time, and Rounders had been around for, I guess, a few years at that stage, and uh, that, was, that was a thing that brought a lot of people into poker. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I met the guy a couple of times. The first time was in Barcelona, 2007. I, I was lucky enough to qualify for the World Heads Up Championship. I would have played him in the second round, but I lost my first match. I don't want to talk about it. But I did I did watch the guy who beat me play Devilfish in the second round, and he was dominating Devilfish for a long period in that match, and Devilfish became very unsportsmanlike at times. And he was mucking his cards straight into the dealer's chest, and I tell this story because the dealer had one of the best responses ever. He very calmly said, is that a fold? <laughs> now, I didn't like that part of Devilfish, but I'll tell you what. Afterwards, he was singing, playing the piano. He really is quite a character. He definitely is, yeah. I, I remember, actually, um, I'm trying to remember when it was, but it was. It would have been in, uh, around that time, like 99, maybe. I don't know. You probably know more than me. The, the first series of the WPT. Uh, so the Devilfish... I think that uh, was 2002, maybe. Oh, okay, so it's later. All right, so the Devilfish came to uh, Luton, which is a provincial town north of London. Pretty kind of grotty. And uh, no offense to people from Luton, but it is. And um, they had a series of tournaments just before Christmas, uh, which they called the Luton Christmas Cracker. And I remember Devilfish was kind of a big deal then. Like, he'd been on TV and stuff. And... There was a 200 pound tournament and he showed up. And I remember people sort of going, Oh my God, what's he doing in the 200 pound tournament? You know, he's too big for this. And earlier in the week, I remember there was a situation where he was having a row with somebody on his telephone and he kept on, uh, he kept on having to miss hands while he was arguing on the phone. And it seemed to be something to do with the booking of his hotel. And it seemed to be taking a long time and he had to speak to three or four different people. In between that, he was in, he was on the big blind and I was uh, in middle position. And I thought, well, I might as well steal his blind while he's busy. So I raised, and uh, he decided to three bet me. And I kind of knew the devil fish was like likely to be aware of what I was up to. So I thought, well, I think I'm going to four bet because 
even though nobody really thought bet in those days unless they had at least jack, I just felt like I could get away with this one. So I thought bet him. I think I had a 6 8 suited. And uh, he fired bet shoved on me. And uh, obviously I folded. And he showed me douche five off suits. No way. Uh, so yeah, we had, we had quite a big laugh about that. But later on in the week, we both made the final table of this tournament. I made the final table of the, the main event of the week, which I, I think was like a 500 pounds or a thousand pounds freeze out, maybe something like that. Anyway, he was, I was the short stack and he had like half the chips in play at the start of the final. And somehow I got to be heads up with him, but he had like a seven to one chip lead. And uh, it was 10,000 10, to the winner, 10,000 pounds and 5,000 to second. People were kind of saying that Devilfish was, you know, having a few hard times at that time and he, he really needed to get a, get a win ready, ready to go off and play the WPT, which was uh, uh, in Foxwoods. It was the first season of the WPT. And uh, he, he beat me heads up, and uh, he went over to Foxwoods, and he made the final of the main event, and, and I think that was basically his bankroll to go over there. He managed to win the main event, I think Phil Helmuth was commentating on the final, and Phil Ivey was in the final, and Phil Helmuth said it was the most impressive performance he'd ever seen on a final table by anybody, and that was that was the basically what got Devil Fisher's ultimate bet deal. He probably did quite well out If I could have just beaten him heads up, you see, he'd have never been representing Ultimate. He <laughs> wouldn't have been able to afford the buy into the main. I'm only kidding, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> History would have changed. Hey, i got to ask you, um, I've been to uh, London for the EPT once. Uh, I was covering it for Poker Pro Magazine. And I obviously had to visit the Crown Vic. It's a great place. Uh, for our listeners who have never been, can you tell us about that poker room, that casino, and, and how long have you been grinding out a wage there? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's changed a lot, actually in recent years. The, the Victoria Casino was the place in London long before casinos were legal. So there was a kind of a grey area about the whole thing. And it existed in a different guise at a different premises. And then it kind of merged into another club and moved to the current site in the, in the I think, the late 50s. And then they legalised casinos in the mid-60s. But it was, it was called the Victoria Sporting Club. Because it was a thing that if you're a bookmaker in the UK, you uh, you join a trade association called the Victoria Sporting Club. And if you're a member of the Victoria Sporting Club, it kind of meant that you're an honourable bookmaker. So even though you weren't licensed or really legal, people knew that they could bet with you because if you didn't pay up, the Victoria Sporting Club would, would meet the debts. So uh, people bookmakers that were members of the Victoria Sporting Club would, would kind of... Uh, be seen to be above all the other bookmakers. And the headquarters of the Victoria Sporting Club was Edgware Road, where the Victoria Casino is. And they just had a little card game among all the bookmakers. And it developed into the Victoria Casino. Wow. Uh, that was that was how the whole thing originated. The bookies would all get together at lunchtime and, you know, talk business and whatever. And then they'd have a little card game. That must have um, been quite a game. Yeah, I'd imagine, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I started going there quite late, really. I was, I was like 20 before I ever went there. You know, it's legal in the UK to go to a casino at 18. I was too nervous to go there, actually. It was like, I knew it was like the HQ of poker. And I was playing poker in a couple of other casinos. But I was like, no, that place is, you know, the, the players are too good and it's too big and the games are massive. They used to have a game then. So that would, that would have been uh, uh, too many years ago, 20, 27 years ago. They had a game then, which was, uh, it was a thousand low you needed a thousand pounds to sit down, so 1500 US, and uh, everybody would ante, and it's London local, so it's a low game, so it's a big bluffing game, and there were a couple of guys that were really good at it, actually, and they, some of the other guys felt like there was too much gambling in the game for them, and they wanted to, uh, they wanted to grind out a win, so they introduced Omaha to the game, it became PLO and, uh, and local, but the time when I first started going in the casino, that game was running Thursday through Sunday. Donald Hart Day was a big player in that game. He would have, he would be in it every single time. And I, I would go in and they, you would sort of say, well, what games have you got? And they would say, well, you can have the low ball where the average stack is like 25 grand. And we're talking 27 years ago. Or you can or you can play uh, a pound running anti seven card stud where it's a hundred pound minimum to sit down. And everybody's like, the average age is 73, and they've all played with each other at least 15 years. Or there's a 50p one pound uh, blinds game, which is a round of each. That would be Pot Limit Holden, Pot Limit Omaha. So that was basically the only game you could play in. It was 50 to sit down, 
It was deal yourself. They didn't even give you a dealer. Uh, there was definitely a bit of cheating going on. <laughs> and, uh, the waiting list was like a week. You know, you'd go in and you put your name down. You might wait five hours to get a seat. Wow. But they never, they never start a second game. Never understood that. Well, I gotta say, I, I've got a huge crush on Victoria Corin. I mean, I met her at the Vic. Uh, she recently left Poker Stars, not agreeing with the direction of the company as it gets more into gaming. I'm wondering what you think of that and what you think of Victoria. I mean, she's a very attractive lady, right? <laughs> she's a good friend of mine, actually. Yeah, I was just talking to her the other day. Um, she told me she won three awards at the British Poker Awards just recently, and she said to me, "I don't want to go because they might see that I'm pregnant." And I said, "Well, they're going to see eventually." Uh, anyway, she told me, well, I'm, I don't want people to know, we're kind of keeping it quiet, private, whatever. And then her husband, uh, I don't know whether you're aware, she got married, and the guy she married is a, is a famous TV comedian. No, I didn't know uh, that. And, yeah, he's like a super famous comedian, uh, called David Mitchell, very good guy, very, very funny guy. And um, he was just on the Jonathan Ross show, like, two weeks ago. And uh, she just told me, oh, yeah, we're keeping it very quiet and everything. He was on the Jonathan Ross show, the big chat show, probably the second biggest chat show in the UK <laughs> for viewers. And Jonathan Ross said, I understand you're about to become a father. And I looked at his face and I, I, I reckon they hadn't planned the question beforehand. <laughs> uh, he kind of looked like he was like, what are you doing to me? And then he asked the question. And now I think they're kind of happy that everyone knows. So congratulations to them. Yeah, she's she still plays poker. She has a she has a Tuesday home game around her house. Uh, they play twenty five B fifty B blinds, and the games are very esoteric. There's uh, there's a lot of uh, you know pips and flashes. There's uh, uh, two card release, uh, seven card stud with deuces and black jacks, wild, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. She plays that every week, and then she, yeah, she's still, I think she went to the EPT in Deauville and played it with no patches on, so she's still very much playing. All right, now you've had some success at the WSOP, to say the least, 33 caches. What, how do you gear up for a World Series of Poker? It's quickly approaching. Oh, uh, no, yeah, well, actually, uh, it's funny, but the first time I ever went to the World Series was 97. I've been going to Vegas for about four or five years, off and on, and the first few trips, I, I just remember now, it seems weird now to think of it, but I was so intimidated by the poker rooms and stuff, I didn't even play poker the first few times, I would go and look and watch, and I thought, well, the, the rules are probably all completely different to England, you know, the etiquette, are just in terms of, like, playing behind, and, you know, what do you, what do, you do when you want chips, and, you know, how many, there was stuff about, like, in limit poker, about the number of raises you could do, and I... I just thought it all varied casino to casino, and I didn't like to ask anyone being very English and everything like that. So the first time I went to the World Series in 97, and this went through until 2001, I just didn't play tournaments. I would go, and I would just sit in a cash game. Like The World Series would last for uh, about five weeks in those days, and it would be in May. And uh, I would just go for like three weeks, usually, and just sit in a cash game for three weeks. Just a way to pay rent. Yeah, I just play like 14 hours a day in a cash game. And then I usually try and have a cracker getting into the main event. From the first time I tried it, the 2001 I tried it, I got off the plane, I jumped into a super satellite for 200, and uh, I won a seat. So it was a rebuy one. And I thought, oh, this is easy. And for a few years, I won a seat every year, and I thought, oh, it's the easiest thing ever. In fact, the first time I played it, I probably... I probably felt like I should have had a good chance to win it, really. It was the year when Robert Varconi won the tournament. I just wish I could. If, if ever I have a regret in poker, I'd like to get that day back again that I got busted. Because I had so many big hands where it was marginal and I should have gambled. <clears throat> and I was so nervous. I just felt like if someone was like a famous player that I'd seen on TV and they, and they three-bet or four-bet me, they must have it. That was, that was the way I thought in those days. If Which you could have that bad. over again, knowing what you know today about poker, you would have played it differently. Of course, if they could have it over, they'd all... Everyone says, oh, God, it must have been so easy in those days. But the thing is, there were literally three poker books. And there wasn't training videos. And we hadn't seen TV with whole card cameras and stuff. And, you know, people didn't know enough about... I know was, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to poker. People think I'm, like, super old school. I mean, I was playing in the 90s, but... It was like a twice a month thing. I didn't really start playing for a living until 2005, which was, you know, I mean, I used to, I've been a gambler for a living the whole time, but poker was always an incidental. But the World Series, is, it, it became something that got bigger and bigger, as you know, 
more and more events. But for me personally, it got bigger and bigger. I, from, I would go for two weeks, then the next year I went for three weeks, and the next year I went for four weeks. And suddenly, the, between like 2003 to 2013, I, I just went for the whole thing, every time. And, uh, you know, from the first card being dealt in the dealers tournament to the, the now the November 9th, I was there every day. Uh, and last year, I didn't go at all. Just didn't really fancy it. Wasn't like uh, there was a few things I didn't enjoy about it the year before, and I just felt like the World Cup was on and there was other stuff going on, and I just didn't fancy it. And this year, do you know, I kind of feel the same. I I, I want to play the main event for sure, and I'm really looking forward to that. But there's certainly been years where I've played the main event, and I know I'm burnt out by the time it's come round. And it's such a good tournament, and it's a lot of money to buy up to play one poker tournament. How much money you have? I'm going to go over there and be nice and fresh, and I might play a couple of side events and the main event. I'll probably stop for like two weeks. Well, it's interesting because I just interviewed Matt Stout, who's a 20-something young guy and been around forever. He, he said he's playing like 35 to 40. Every event that he can possibly be in. But he's probably been doing that for, I don't know, maybe at least six years. Maybe, maybe, I don't know how old Matt is now. I don't, I, I don't want to guess. I think he's about 29 or something. But yeah, I mean, that's I couldn't I, do I, it. I remember Matt for at least six years doing that. So it must be longer than that. I mean, I, yeah, I know that laugh. I can hear it from here, actually. <laughs> you mentioned your biggest regret was perhaps that main event the year of Arconi won. Kind of leads into this question. I interviewed Padraig Parkinson, Irishman, finished third at the 99 main event. I asked him if he ever thought about that third place finish and how close he was to becoming world champion and he said quote only every day of my life but at the time i was just thrilled with the money i had a beat max video of, of uh, him playing in that and i watched that like 200 times and every single time he looks like uh, he looks like he should have won it and he looks like the best player Although I love Noel Furlong, I think he was really underestimated. The reason I bring it up is because the bracelet has thus far eluded you. You've come second twice. 2010, the 5,000 No Limit Hold'em shootout, you got 273,000 for that. And then again in 2012, where you were second in a 1,500 No Limit Hold'em event for $406,000. These days in those 1,500s, that's no easy feat, let me tell you. Can you tell us about those two final tables, about each experience? Yeah. And does it still bother you that you were that close? I mean, it definitely bothers me, and I, I'm the same as Porridge, like, every day it bothers me, I mean, or every time I think about it, but um, th there's definitely a tale of two final tables, the, the first one was a, you know, a very tough tournament, the five case uh, shootout, I think those shootouts, are like, if you look at the people that win the tables in those shootouts, they're always good players, you know, it's really hard to fluke your way through one of those, and we got into the final, and it was a tough final, and it was just one of those things, I, I, Every, there wasn't really like a big dominant stack at the start of the final, but I was, and it was a six-handed final, and I was kind of, I, I guess I might have been fifth uh, going into the final, but I was fifth and not really, only maybe five big blinds behind being second. So it was really quite close between second and sixth. And I tried a few things early on. I three bet a guy and he four bet me, or somebody else called four bet, and I didn't really have a hand. Uh, you know, a couple of things like that, and suddenly I'm a little bit of a short stack. And I thought, well, I've got to try and get back into this one. And uh, they don't seem to be, you know, I need to move up to a game where they respect my raises. They weren't respecting my raises. So I'd, I'd raised a few times, I got three bet and four bet and stuff. And I don't know, I felt like I needed to change things up. And it's hard because the, the natural reaction in that situation is to play tight for a while. And I couldn't really afford to play tight for too long now. So I, uh, I ordered some sushi. And uh, I started like fiddling with the sushi, and I uh, I was like squeezing the wasabi and <laughs> mixing up the uh, the soy sauce and making a little well to dip it into. And then I got my chopsticks out and I cleaned them, and I made a real big fuss out of it. And then I three bet shoved on a guy, and I immediately went back to eating while he was making his decision, and he folded. He actually folded quite a good hand. He showed like he showed a card that he, he had a good hand. I carried on eating now, and I scraped my chips in like I like I was really not too bothered at all. <laughs> uh, and about twelve minutes later, I started fiddling with the sushi again. I got some more wasabi out, and I played with it, and I mixed it up, and everything like that. And somebody raised, and I three bet shoved again, and the guy instantly folded. And afterwards, the guy who came third in that tournament, Stuart Rutter. 
he said to me, um, the reason I folded to you that one time was because you were fiddling so much with the, the sushi. I thought, you know, you left off from what you were doing. Uh, you obviously must have had a really big hand. And I said, well, I had a, I had a Jack 8 suited. And I felt like if I did the whole wasabi thing, maybe you might think that. So it was a ploy. He was like, oh, no, I, a part of me thought it was a ploy. He said, I was <laughs> Like you did it so well, like, so I was really pleased with myself about that. And I think that maybe kind of kept me hanging in there. And it was a very strange final, though, because, uh, you know, like, I was, uh, what's his name, uh, the French guy, lovely French guy, uh, uh, Nikolai, Nikolai Levy. He got, he got knocked out in sixth, and um, suddenly there was only, you know, I was fifth out of five, and I only had, like, 18 bigs or something. And everybody else just went to war. The two people got into a massive raising war, and it was like a six-bet shove. And then when they turned the cards over, it was tens against ace-jack. Six-bet shove on a call. And then two other people got into a raising war, and it was like ace-queen against two jacks or something. And suddenly, I'm heads up. And it's like, I've got, I'm 12 to 1 underdog, heads up. But the difference between coming fifth and coming second was like 175 grand. And all I did was fold three heads. That's when a second place feels real good. That was a brilliant second place. I mean, we played heads up for like three hands. I think I found an ace three, the third hand, or something like that. And he had a dominating ace. And, and that was it. Like, he, he won. And I was like, wow, I was supposed to come like fifth or maybe fourth if I'm lucky. And I've come second. And I, I wasn't even bothered at all. People were saying, oh, does it feel bad to come so close? So I was like, A, it's a really tough tournament. And B... You know, these guys just kind of gave me an extra hundred grand. At the right. End. The other one is so painful. I mean, it's just really painful. I had uh, I had really good chips, like double average the whole final. I think I had half the chips in play four-handed or even five-handed. We got heads up, and I had like a four-to-one chip lead or something. I got it up to like an eight-to-one chip lead, and uh, I, I think I lost seven all-in showdowns. Seven consecutive. I mean, I'm not complaining in terms of, like, I wasn't, like, well ahead in them. But there were standard situations. Like, heads up, I raised the button, ace nine suited, he jams on me for, like, 18 bigs. I call, he has ace ten. You know, it, it was like that. But it, seven on the spin is painful. And, uh, yeah, I lost I, I lost a flip to get back in it at the end, like, two fours against ace jack or something. But And, it, and I think he hit on the river as well. So it was... Yeah, that was a really... Uh, we played heads up for about six hours. Wow. And, uh, three times I was five to one or bigger favorite uh, in chips. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty tough. I mean, it was a tough final, actually. I think uh, I think there were seven pros on the final. So, it was... Those 1500s, you know, I think when the structure... Uh, you know, the structure... People have got used to it now a little bit, and... A lot of people complain about the structure, but I actually really love the structure in that. And now, this year, they're giving five times starting stack. I think it's going to get tougher for the recreationals and those. Hmm. Well, listen, we're running out of time here, Neil. We really appreciated okay. this, but you are an ambassador for Sky Poker. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of Sky because uh, that's where I can watch Sky darts on the live stream. I'm wondering if you're a darts fan. You know, poker seems to be... A lot like darts, because darts has grown massively, hasn't it? Gambling's a part of it, the sponsors. Are, uh... Yeah, I agree. I agree. He, he plays a little bit of poker, Michael Van Gerwen. We sometimes see him on the London scene, and he, I think he's going to Vegas on holiday soon. But he, um, yeah, he, the, 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 the snooker players all used to play poker. Uh, they still do, actually, but that, that was a big thing when they were crossing over to poker. It's a kind of a similar thing, you know, on the circuit. You're traveling around provincial towns. You stay for a week for a tournament, and uh, you know if you don't get any prize money out of it, you you, you know you've had an expensive week. It's a, it's a very similar thing, and I think yeah, the, they have a similar mentality. Those guys, I quite I quite like it. But uh, yeah, Sky Bet have been uh, Sky Sky Poker is it's a it's a nice thing. I've got a little deal with them. You know they they wanted somebody that would uh, be already established in the UK. I guess. Signing up young guys who are sort of up and coming. The problem is that a lot of them quit poker after a while and do something else, and maybe they can't be relied upon to, you know, write a blog or do do podcasts or whatever. You know, they so they 
you know, they know I'm going to be around. I've been around a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously you're one of the most recognizable faces in the game. Real quick before we let you go here, I know you have a background in bookmaking. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. What is your best sports betting moment, and did it happen at the racetrack? Uh, that's funny. Um, I don't know. One of the biggest was the Super Bowl, I guess, when the, when the Rams won for the first time. Uh, I can't remember what year that would have been, about 2002? Something like uh, that, yeah. It was a while ago. I was on, uh, yeah, I was on them at 100 to 1, and I bet them again at 66 to 1, 50 to 1, 33 to 1. On the day, you could lay like uh, 225, they were minus 225, and uh, I bet them again. I like them so much. And you remember the uh, the outstretched arm right at the end? Where yeah, you know, uh, right who was that quarterback? I know, he tried to get in there on the pass, and they, they yeah, tackled him, wow. He stretches his arm in a kind of gorilla kind of way, and... <laughs> doesn't quite get there and he kind of gets pulled back his arm into the into the you know the melee yeah. that was probably as exciting as it gets really yeah i didn't hit anything i pressed and pressed and pressed that was uh, air uh, mcnair steve mcnair made the pass and the guy yeah. was just so close inches inches yeah i mean that was i mean there must <laughs> be people in the world that were the other side of that for a similar amount i mean that probably wasn't like my biggest ever win but it was in terms of what i had at the time it was pretty important and uh yeah, it was pretty exciting. I mean, the racetrack has been... Yeah, when I was a bookie at the races, we had some pretty weird ups and downs. Yeah, I, I, I had a couple of, you know, pretty messy ones. But, yeah, I, I think that, that Super Bowl was probably... Uh, I don't know. Those things... I, the, the, like, the World Series main event, the Super Bowl, the Grand National Big Horse Race in England, Cheltenham Big Series of Horse Races, and Royal Ascot. Those are the five things where... I kind of struggled to sleep the night before, and they're still exciting. And those are all good. And then maybe the Irish Open as well. I'm going to the Irish Open this week. I should be more excited. Oh, about that's that. right. I forgot to mention, and I don't want to be remiss in doing that. Uh, the Irish Open is quickly approaching. It's this weekend. Yeah. I know it holds a special place in your heart because 2008, I mean, you were the man. Yeah, that was, it was, yeah, it was amazing. When I think back, it's, it's, it was amazing. I mean, it was... I, it was funny, you know, there's a picture of me at the end kind of stretching my arms out that's been on the internet a lot. I actually kind of faked the emotion. Uh, when, it came to, when it came to the end, I was just so tired, I just wanted to sleep. And uh, they said to me, you don't look excited enough. So I said, is this okay for you? I uh, kind of smiled. And then everyone got that picture, and now they're like, look at that joy and emotion. And uh, it was really, I just felt like, I kind of felt like, it looks like I don't care enough about it. I really cared about it. I was just exhausted. And, uh, well, a lot yeah. of people on this side of the pond, they don't realize that the Irish Open is kind of like the World Series of Poker over there. I mean, let's let's be honest. It's one of the oldest tournaments. I think the year you won, there were 667 entries. You won more than a million bucks. I mean, it was pretty big. It was massive. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, the EPT is bigger money now to an extent. But, I mean, some of the EPT events are. But I can't remember the names of too many EPT winners. I can't connect them with the city they won it. I know, you know, I can sort of say, well, you know, Lipbury won. I think I remember that was Sam Remo. And I remember Jake Cody won in Deauville. But that's maybe because they're English. Uh, I don't remember too many of the German guys and which ones they won. I, know, I think generally, unless you're like working for the EPT or you're a tour regular, you don't really remember who won which ones. But people remember the Irish Open. Uh, it's definitely... Uh, I guess the London EPT maybe is, is, but in Europe, really, the World Series of Poker Europe never really took off the way it should have done. I don't know why, maybe the buy-in's a little high, I'm not really sure. £10,000 is, you know, it's more like $15,000. I don't know, I don't know. The, the Irish Open still, they, they lost it for a couple of years. The Sheen went off of it because they uh, they dropped the buy-in down to uh, two, 2,000 euros, so it's, uh, you know, it's kind of twenty five hundred dollars or whatever. Whereas it had always been closer to five thousand dollars. This year they've whacked it back up again, and I think there's no. The last year it clashed with an EPT. This year there's nothing else going on, so I think they're going to get their luster back. They got they got Mike Sexton going over there. I hear uh, Akira Scott, who came second in it uh, the year after I won it. She she's coming back to play it. I don't think she's been back to play it since. So. It's going to be good. It'll be really good. I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's a great tournament with some great history. Neil Channing, I uh, really appreciate this, man. Thanks for being a high roller. Good luck at the 2015 WSOP in the main event, and uh, hopefully we can give you some high roller radio mojo. Fingers crossed. You never know. <laughs>